uh, the northwestern U.S., one of the most beautiful parts of the country. Uh, he was, this, this I find very interesting, he was baptized as a Catholic, as a child. He was raised in the Mormon uh, religion. And uh, he became a Christian, though, in high school through the ministry of St. John Luther in Idaho Falls, Idaho. I feel like there's a, there's a lot of stories. There's a lot of stories. That's a whole other lecture. Yeah, that's right. Um, Travis completed his doctorate uh, last year um, from Western Seminary in Portland, Oregon. And his dissertation focused on the intersection of Luther's theology of vocation that we're hearing about tonight and the field of life and executive coaching. And so Travis now is the executive director of wellness and coaching for uh, the southeastern district of the Lutheran Church in the Missouri Center. So one of the things he's been focusing on, he may say something about this, uh, he's been focusing on coaching church leaders through the after effects of the pandemic and all the, um, all the impact that had on their churches. Uh, but he's going to speak to us tonight on discerning your vocation, wisdom from the theology of Martin Luther. So thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Glad to be here. Thanks. Let's welcome, Charlie. Uh, good to be with all of you today. Uh, I actually, for a lot of years, was praying how to maybe uh, do some sort of ministry kind of thing here at William & Mary. And then I met John uh, probably, what, six, nine months ago, something like that. And he mentioned Cambridge House and uh, invited me to come to share with all of you tonight. So um, as anybody who's finished a doctorate and dissertation, I've got way more to share than actually we can fit into 45 minutes. So if you want additional reading, I got a whole chapter on Luther's teaching on vocation I can send you afterwards if you want to dive deeper into it. Uh, but to, I just want to share some kind of um, highlights of a lot of that work, and especially, as John mentioned, Luther's teaching on this incredible topic and coaching and, and the practical application of that. Uh, I would like to start tonight, though, by um, sharing kind of a concept uh, that kind of, I think, sets the table for us tonight. So there was a book called The Great Emergence uh, that was written a few years ago by a woman by the name of Phyllis Tickle. Uh, she has now been called to glory uh, with Jesus. But um, in the book, she talks about this idea that every 500 years, the church has a rummage sale. And so basically, we go up into the attic and, and we dig around and we decide to have this, this yard sale. And we bring down items of not sure what the value is, how old they are. But maybe you kind of discover that there's something that's been hidden of value up there in the attic. It's kind of like uh, antique roadshow. You know, you go in and somebody brings in something and it's like, well, I've got this. It's been in the family for years. Is it worth anything? And either it's like, nah, that's just a common thing. I'm sure it has sentimental value, but really it's not worth anything. Or somebody who has this hidden treasure and suddenly they find out, wow, this has been sitting up in the attic or on a mantle all these years, not knowing its true value. Well, 500 years ago, uh, we did a rummage sale, like went up into the attic as the church uh, with the Reformation. And we came out with some lost treasures that had been still there, but hadn't been valued for really what it was. Uh, justification by grace through faith, uh, the uh, pr primary uh, authority of the word of God, but then we also too had a couple other treasures that we had brought out, but then kind of stuck back up in the attic. Well, 500 years later, and we just had actually a few years ago, the 500th anniversary of the Reformation. So it's a good time to kind of see what we still got up in the attic. And there's two things in particular that I think are incredibly valuable for today's day and age. One of them, which I'm gonna be talking about tonight is Luther's teaching on vocation and something very closely associated with that is the uh, teaching on the priesthood of all believers. So there's definitely a, an alignment and intersection of those two teachings, but I primarily wanna focus on the idea of vocation. Now, let me start off by doing a little word association game. Um, when you hear the word vocation, what do you think about? I say vocation, you say? Career. Career, job. Typically, in our modern age, we've reduced vocation as to what you do for your job, what you do for your career, or maybe you have vocational schools that are out there. But for Luther, vocation really kind of was a concept that looked at the life, the entire life of a Christian. Yes, what you do for career, but so much more, which we're gonna take a look at. The word vocation comes from the Latin word vocatio, which means to have a call. 
And one of the foundational verses for Luther as he was digging into the scriptures and discovering these treasures um, that were found there was this idea of calling from Ephesians 4, um, chapter or verse 1, in which we hear this, uh, the Apostle Paul writing, As a prisoner for the Lord, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling, the vocation that you've received. Here Paul, he's in prison as he lives out his calling as an apostle and a missionary uh, all throughout Asia Minor and Europe. And he's encouraging those at the Church of Ephesus to not forget their calling that they have. It's a calling that's from God in Christ, but it's a calling that's also lived out in daily life. Well, in Luther's day, uh, the understanding of calling was really the only people who had callings were priests. Monks, nuns, those in the monastery doing religious things for God, oftentimes disconnected from daily life. Love and service to neighbor. Yes, it was very holy kind of things they were doing, but it didn't have impact on people's everyday life of those around them. But as Luther dug in and he looked at what this teaching of calling and vocation was, he found that it really was uh, much more encompassing and not just for those who were working within the church had a holy calling there, but really seeing that anybody, any believer in life could have a holy calling. In fact, uh, Luther wrote in the Babylonian captivity, one of his really uh, primary works that he uh, wrote, he wrote this, the works of priests or monks and priests, however holy and arduous they may be, do not differ one whit in the sight of God from the works of the rustic laborer in the field or the woman going about her household task. But all works are measured before God by faith alone. And what Luther was advocating was that, yes, monks, priests, nuns had holy callings, but so did bakers and laborers, and magistrates, and the growing um, merchant class that was developing, and princes, and, and others, that anybody, as they live out their daily calling in Christ, had a holy calling. In fact, Luther even goes on, he writes this to the uh, Christian nobility of the German nation, there is no true basic difference between layman and priest, princes and bishops, between the religious and secular, except for the sake of the office and work but not for the sake of status. They are all spiritual estates. They're all truly priests, bishops, and popes, but they do not all have the same work they do. A cobbler, a smith, a peasant, each has a work in an office of, of his trade, and yet they are all alike consecrated priests and bishops. Now, this is pretty radical when you think about the world that Luther grew up in. Yes, there were monks and nuns having holy callings, but what he did was also elevated everybody else to say your calling, though different, this is not to diminish the work of pastors and nuns and monks, but it was to say everybody's calling was holy, that there was significance to everybody's vocation in life. And so what this really did was it helped to take a look at the world, not that those who work in the church, that's some sort of a holy thing for God, and then the rest of secular life was not. That for Luther, all of life was holy. Every calling somebody had, whether in career or otherwise, as we're gonna see, was something given by God and had significance from a spiritual uh, perspective. Uh, in fact, actually, this speaks a lot against some attitudes that are still in the world today. There was a recent Barna study from a few years ago that found that when people were asked of different careers, is that a calling or not? You could imagine what's at the top of the list. Pastor, worship leader, Christian school teacher, maybe church secretary, considered callings. But what about an accountant? What about um, a garbage collector? I have a brother who's a garbage collector. Now, we tend to look kind of lowly on jobs like that, don't we? And yet, let me ask you, where would our communities be if we didn't have people who came and picked up our trash? You know, we would have a, a, an odor. If you've ever walked by a dumpster in the middle of summer, you know how bad your community could get if you didn't have trash picked up, left out there for a couple of weeks. And any community in which they've had sanitation workers go on strike for a while could attest that it gets pretty bad. 
And with that also sickness, disease, um, rodents, rats that uh, start to multiply, it's not a good situation. Um, so this really takes a look at, it's not just church workers, it's anybody and whatever you do is a holy calling from God. In fact, I even had a member of one of my congregations uh, in the San Francisco Bay Area, and uh, he was like, Pastor, I want to do something significant for God. And I said, well, what do you do for a living? And he said, well, I coordinate medical supplies around the world. And I'm like, what are you talking about? That's a holy calling from God. You are used by God to bring healing and health to the world by facilitating the delivery of medicines and equipment that's needed so that people can be healthy. That's, that's a holy calling. So for Luther, when he considered this idea of vocation, he saw calling in terms of two primary relationships, or uh, theologically, he talked about this idea of righteousness. So he said that um, there, there are two kinds of righteousness or relationships for a believer. The first is your relationship with God, this vertical relationship that we have. The second is your horizontal relationship with your neighbor. Now, for Luther, he called this vertical passive righteousness. Now, by the way, let's define righteousness. We hear that term, it's a nice churchy word that we have, but righteousness simply means how to be in a right relationship. So the question vertically, how are you in a right relationship? Luther said you are passively. There's nothing you do. In fact, uh, a place that we could point to to show this is a passage that many Christians are familiar with, Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. Well, my tradition especially, we live in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing, it's a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Stop. That passage is speaking about that vertical relationship. We are saved by grace, through faith, not by works, nothing you can do, free gift. You just simply receive that passively through faith in Christ. But a passage my tradition often doesn't focus on is verse 10. That's talking about this active righteousness, Luther called it, because while we receive a right relationship with God passively, there are active things we have to do to be in right relationship with our neighbor. And so this is Ephesians uh, 2.10, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. And in my tribe, boy, this is a kind of a dirty word, good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. That there are good works that we are all called to do. Now, the good works can be general good works, you know, like um, I'm sure after dinner, well, you guys had paper plates, but you know, if you had dishes, cleaning the dishes, maybe helping a neighbor who's sick uh, with a meal or mowing their yard, there's all kind of general service that we can do. There's also, and we're gonna get about it into it a little bit more, there's also unique good works that are also related to your workmanship, God's gifting and design in your life. So general and specific, but we're all called to love and serve neighbor. And for Luther, that's really kind of what vocation was about. It's first of all, this vertical relationship, that is your primary calling. And so for Luther, he saw that really this calling is one that also gives us an identity in life that cannot be changed or taken away. Uh, we hear from Galatians 3, 26 through 27. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. So for Luther, the calling that you have vertically is the calling to be God's child. Um, that was God's original calling there in the beginning. It's his calling that's now restored to you through faith in Christ. Uh, Luther uh, even kind of talks about this in his work, uh, The Two Kinds of Righteousness. He said this righteousness, and he's talking about this vertical, this passive righteousness, then is given to men in baptism whenever they truly repent. Therefore, a man uh, can with confidence boast in Christ and say, mine are Christ's living, doing and speaking, his suffering and dying, mine as much as if I had lived, done, spoken, suffered, and died as he did. 
And so now this is unique to our tradition. Probably you would also see this more in the Anglican or the Catholic or the Orthodox. Um, we see that God does stuff through uh, sacraments like baptism. And in this case, part of what he does is he places his name on us as we're baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And there is an adoption as children of God. And pro the promises of all that Jesus did upon the cross by his life, death, and resurrection are freely given through that promise, as well as faith. This is, by the way, we call this a means of grace. Uh, so we see it as a delivery system, along with hearing the word and the Lord's Supper, in which faith is delivered, grace is delivered. Uh, but primarily, it's an identity, a calling that we have that is given through this. And so as Galatians 2.20 says, I've been crucified with Christ. And I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Now, there's also kind of a secondary identity or calling. Um, it's not just to be children of God, but we hear about this in 1 Peter 2, 9 through 10. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you're the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. In this, we receive a calling of being the, the, the priesthood of all believers, the royal priesthood. Uh, Luther speaks about this, and, and again, he identifies the placement of this call and this identity in baptism. He says, we are all consecrated priests by baptism. As St. Peter says, you are a royal priesthood and a priestly realm. Uh, the Apocalypse says, Thou hast made us to be kings and priests by thy blood. And so what we see is this identity of being the royal priesthood, those who are called to rule and those who are called to serve. And this is a calling that was originally given to us there at the very creation of the world, that God called us to be this, this pinnacle between his creation and him, that we would serve on his behalf, partnering with him in the care of creation, and then to bring the praises of creation back to God in our worship in living out this identity. It's an identity that was lost because of sin, but it's now been restored through faith in Christ, through Jesus, who is the ultimate royal, royal priest. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He is the one who rules all things, and yet, though, he came not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. And now our identity through faith in Christ is that we are called to be and to do the same. We are seated with Christ in the heavenly realms we hear in Ephesians, but we are also called in this life to love and serve and be his representatives uh, in this world today. Now, in living that out, we also hear about how we live out this calling in Christ in our daily life in love and service to our neighbors. Um, so in the horizontal, not the vertical, but the horizontal callings, um, we hear in Galatians 5, 14, for the whole law uh, is fulfilled in one word, or in the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. That when we consider the, our horizontal relationships as active righteousness, for Luther, it was all about love and service to your neighbor. Uh, in fact, actually, in our catechism teaching that we do with young people in our tradition, uh, when we take a look at the Ten Commandments, we often make the distinction between the first three commandments being primarily about your response through faith in your relationship with God, have no other gods, keep the Sabbath day, don't misuse the name of the Lord, but the other seven have to do with our relationship with our neighbor. And Luther has a number of different explanations about this. But in regard to this, this act of righteousness, this horizontal calling of loving and serving neighbor, uh, Luther writes in his work, The Freedom of the Christian, which is one of my favorite works of Luther. He says this, Man, however, needs none of these for his righteousness and salvation. And what he's referring to are good works. You don't need any of them for this. The only good works we trust in for our salvation are the good works of Jesus. It's all Jesus all the time, grace through faith. So what do we do with good works? Well, he says, therefore, um, he should be guided in all of his works by this thought and contemplate this one thing alone, 
that he may serve and benefit others in all that he does, considering nothing except the need and the advantage of his neighbor. So he said, good works aren't here, good works are for here, for your neighbor. Or, as Gustav Wingren says in his uh, book, Luther on Vocation, it's not God who needs your good works, it's your neighbor who does. Which is very freeing in my tradition, because we can talk about good works, as long as we keep them here and just don't do them here. Which is also, by the way, the expert of the law in Luke, who came and asked Jesus, how must you be saved? And Jesus said, well, you're the expert, how do you read it? Love the Lord your God, love your neighbor as yourself. I mean, that's, and Jesus said, you're right, that that's what life is about, loving God, loving your neighbor. The problem though for the expert is he said, wanting to justify himself, he said, who's my neighbor? And he tried to take what is done in the horizontal and invert it into the vertical. If you do that, you mess grace up. But if you keep the two relationships separate, we can love and serve our neighbor all the time, knowing who we are in Christ and how we've been saved by grace. Um, so now when it comes to our neighbor in the, the horizontal plane of life, uh, we hear in Romans uh, 13, Paul says this, let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt of love for one another. For whoever loves has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. Whatever other cam command they may be are summed up in this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to the neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. And so as we consider our relationship with our neighbors, you know, we might get caught up in, well, what's the right thing to do? What we would hear from both Luther and Paul is, what does love call us to do? for the sake of our neighbor and letting that be our guide in how we interact and love and serve others. Now, Luther said that this calling we have in Christ lived out in love and service to neighbor is really done in what he would call three stations of life. Uh, the first is one that many people would get as Christians, the church. You know, there are things that we're called to do within the church to help the mission of the church. Uh, but also the family, which for Luther was the foundational calling of all creation. Then also the workplace. And then finally, society, being a good citizen of your neighborhood, your community, your city, your nation. And today in today's global world, being a good global citizen as well. Now in Luther's day, work and church, I'm sorry, work and family were kind of one thing. Because a lot of people were peasants working on farms or in an industry like being a baker or a crafts person. And so, you know, basically what you did, your family also did, and they would take over whatever you did. So that was one and the same. In today's world, we can break those out because often our personal lives with our families and our careers are separate kind of places in which, or, or areas of responsibility that we've been given. But again, for Luther, all these are common callings that we have. It's all about loving and serving our neighbor. I'm not going to get into this too much. I tried to map out in a pictorial way really what Luther's teaching of vocation is. And it's this idea that the Christian has kind of two relationships or where they live their calling. This vertical relationship by grace alone, faith alone, uh, in which we're children of God, the priesthood of all believers. And then the uh, realm of heaven, this horizontal in which we live it out. There's also Luther gets into this a lot of, are we uh, living under the reign of Satan uh, or are we living under the reign of God? Uh, he would define reign of Satan is when we are focused on loving ourselves, wanting what we desire, reign of God, loving our neighbor, when we are other focused rather than self focused. Uh, by the way, that's not just for unbelievers, that's also for Christians. Uh, remember Peter? Uh, you know, he says that he's going to go, Jesus says he's going to go to the way of the cross. And what does Peter respond? Never, Lord. And it's like, what is, how does Jesus respond to that? Get behind me, Satan, before you do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of man. Now, in discerning your vocation, how you live out your calling in Christ in the different areas of responsibility, it's also important to understand God's gifting and workmanship, as we heard in Ephesians 2.10. Yes, we all have common good works we do. 
But we also know that we have been gifted for specific good works that we are called to do as well. Um, so from Psalm 139, 13 through 16, we hear this. For you formed my inward parts, you knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, my soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. And in your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as of yet there was none of them. This beautiful passage of how God, uh, almost like a master artist, a, a craftsman, uh, makes and shapes and, and, and gifts us in unique ways. And that actually there's an, uh, a connection between the days that God has in mind for you connected to the workmanship of how he's designed you. And so if you want to understand why I'm here, what's my purpose in life? We also have to begin to understand not only what is God's call on us and the world in Christ, we also have to understand God's gifting and design as well. And so we hear from, uh, this is uh, from a, a, a writer on Luther's teaching on vocation, uh, individual uh, Gene Edward Veith from his work, uh, God at Work. And he writes this, rather the doctrine of vocation encourages attention to each individual's uniqueness, talents, and personality. These are valued gifts of God who creates and equips each person in a different way with a calling he has in mind for that person's life. The doctrine of vocation undermines conformity. It recognizes the unique value of every person and celebrates human differences. But it sets these individuals into a community with other individuals. And now here's where you know he's really an academic, avoiding the privatizing self-centered narcissism of secular individualism. But basically he says this, listen, there aren't cookie cutter Christians. You know, this isn't just about do what others do. You have to discover what God is calling you to do with your unique personality, your unique talents. These are, are things, you know, now, unfortunately in our world today, we can get a little too focused on, hey, look at me. Well, and so we have been set within Christian communities so that we don't get so focused on self. But what we're doing is we're recognizing the uniqueness of God's gifting, how that's lived out though, uh, through faith and in partnership with others as well. So for me, in a lot of the work I do in coaching, it's helping people to discover what I call their divine GPS, or in terms of their gifts, the gift of their personality, the passions that they have, their core motivations in life, and their strengths, their God-given talents. So as a GPS device um, is used, praise God for GPS. I remember back in the day, my wife and I trying to navigate around uh, with old maps, you know, and to drive in a car with a map was so hard. I praise God that I've got this lady in a phone uh, or in my car who can just say, turn here, go there. And it's like, thank you. And I see the little map. As a GPS device helps you understand where you're at, where you're going and how to get there. I think God has also put a divine GPS within each and every one of us. His gifting, his workmanship and his design in our life. And so in a lot of the work to help people discern, well, what is my calling? Um, I do some work with them around, first of all, what do my gifts and my strengths contribute? How's God wired you? What's, what's the gifting and the talents, the personality that make you uniquely you? What are the passions that he's put in your heart? These core motivations that either get you excited for something or is a deep burden that you have. And then it's this third intersection, uh, asking the question, who needs what I, uh, what I have to offer? I think too big a question is, what does the world need? That's too large. But when you can look around in your life, in your church, in your family, in your workplace, in your community, and you can say, who needs what I uniquely have to offer? That's where you begin to discern where God is calling you to, how best you can love and serve your neighbor. And so where God calls me, my unique good works of love and service aren't the same as yours. They're not the same as yours. They're not the same as yours. We all are called different because we've all been gifted and created differently. Now there's one more thing about Luther's teaching of vocation that to me is like one of the most exciting parts. Luther talks about this idea 
of the masks of God. And so he writes this. Uh, this is from his sermon on Exodus 1525. Thus the Lord is at work in all things. Man must plow, reap, and sow, but he is God's mask. Or as he goes on, um, Gustav Wingren kind of sums up this idea in his book, Luther on Vocation. Man's actions is a medium for God's love to others. The, the life of the whole body is involved in the functioning of each member. And in the exercise of his vocation, man becomes a mask of God. And so I know that on 9-11, and I know that was a lot of years ago for many of you, um, I'm not even sure how many of you were born on uh, before or after 9-11. Um, but, you know, a lot of people were asking, well, where was God on 9-11? Well, I'll tell you where God was. He was with every neighbor helping a neighbor down a fire escape. He was with the first responders who were rushing up to try to put out those fires. He was there with the rescue teams down on the ground. He was there in the fighter jets pilots who were circling, trying to protect the city. He was there with the priest who was praying for people when those buildings came down. In each and every person living out their calling and vocation, God was there in the hidden way through those vocations as a mask. So you might consider this. Well, you know, we pray, uh, Lord, give us this day our daily bread. Well, how does God give us daily bread? He gives us daily bread by the farmer who grows the wheat, through the baker who bakes the bread, through the delivery truck driver who delivers it to the grocery store clerk who sells it, to moms and dads making peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. And each step of the way, God is loving and serving, bringing his blessing, his provision, and his care to the world. So Paul talks about this in Romans of um, authorities who have been given the sword to execute justice. Uh, Luther even talks about when the maiden milks the cow, it's not just the maiden doing it, it's actually God who is milking the cow through her calling and vocation. So Luther writes this in his exposition on Psalm 127. A father is the instrument of procreation, but God is the fountain and author of life. So too, the magistrate is uh, just such an instrument through whom God preserves peace and the law. Uh, in the home, husbands and wives are instruments through whom the Lord increases the human race. Um, even in Luther's work on can uh, Christians be soldiers, he said yes, because God is using and working through them in protecting their nations. Now, one of the struggles, and I know I've got to try to wrap up here quick, that I think a lot of people have, and I would imagine that some of you might be here right now, is you're getting close to school being done, and you're trying to figure out, where do I go from here? Do I go to the left? Do I go to the right? Maybe it's not just two options in the fork in the road. There might be five. What is God calling me to do? What, what is his desire for my life? And it can be kind of paralyzing. Well. What I love is this, Luther uh, wrote this one time, he says, for only two things are necessary, faith and love. Everything else you are free to do or leave undone. What that gives is a lot of freedom, you know, and, and not to worry so much, am I making a mistake? Am I going against God's will? Uh, let me share this, this is Gustav Winger, and again, Luther on vocation, he says, uh, summing up Luther, there is freedom to do if love to another requires it, there's freedom not to do, if that is what love to one's neighbor requires. There is such an action of faith and relationship to God have real significance for the shaping of vocation. Life according to vocation never becomes fixed or rigid. And so in reading Luther and considering God's will for your life, I kind of see it like a river. A river has a lot of bandwidth within it to, to navigate. There's some, um, I, I used to do whitewater rafting near Jackson Hole, Wyoming, just south. And uh, my wife can attest, I love to hit that, that rapid dead on. That gets the best action. She lost your sunglasses one time. I, I nailed that rapid just perfect. There are other parts though in which we don't hit that rapid quite as right, but it's still a good ride. There's other parts of the river in which it's calm and relaxing. Sometimes there's tributaries that you can take that are slow and meandering. It's not really exactly in the main flow of the river, but you're still in the river. Now, you know when you're out of the river. That's when you're up on the bank. So what is God's will? Well, the Ten Commandments can serve, whether you're in the river or out of the river. Love and service to neighbor. Now, you know when you're out of it 
But within it, there's a lot of freedom to navigate. There's a lot of freedom of choice. And even if you make a wrong turn and you don't hit a, a rapid perfectly that time along, there's usually more rapids down the line that you could hit it the next time or making another run. But within the river, as much as there's freedom to navigate, there's also a power to the river that you ultimately can't control. You can try to navigate it, but you can't control it. And this is where you come to, for example, Proverbs 19.21. Many are the plans of a person's heart, but the Lord's purpose prevails. So you navigate, you know, we have freedom, but ultimately God is going to direct. And in some ways, we, while we have freedom, sometimes our freedoms are, are not quite what we think they are. That God's hand moves in a lot of ways to direct us for his purposes that he has in mind for our life. Last thing I want to touch on, and then we're going to do some question and answer. Uh, there's a, a great author by the name of Robert Benny, and he wrote a book called Ordinary Saints. And he says, what are the keys for discerning God's will regarding your calling in life? And he came up with five of them. He said, first of all, gain, uh, gain clarity regarding your own workmanship and design, or as I call it, your divine GPS, your gifts, passions, and strengths, because that will provide a roadmap telling you things you should do and maybe some things you shouldn't do. Then discern the needs of your neighbors in your various areas of responsibility in life, church, family, work, community. Third, guided by the Spirit, discern the intersection. That's the, the three circles we took a look at, looking for that calling sweet spot. Uh, the intersection of your divine GPS and the needs of the world or your neighbor. Fourth, step into God's will by taking on the responsibilities given your various callings through disciplined attachment. And then finally, stepping away, and sometimes this is the hard part, is stepping away from certain responsibilities to take on the new ones that God has called you to through disciplined detachment. You can't do everything. And so sometimes in order to say yes to something, you have to be able to say no to something. And so this is part of the work I do, not only in the doctoral work I did and the study of the teaching, but applying it uh, through doing life and executive and faith coaching uh, with individuals, with groups uh, in ministry and also um, or organizations outside of the church. Uh, and it's a joy to help people through asking powerful questions and, and listening, uh, helping them envision what it might look like to live out the best of who they are, who God designed them to be, to um, develop strategies to, to see that become a reality with encouragement and support along the way. Last two thoughts for you. I love this quote from Martin Luther uh, in his defense and explanation of all the articles. He writes this. This life of righteousness, or I'm sorry, this life is not righteousness, but growth in righteousness. It is not health, but healing. Not being, but becoming. Not rest, but exercise. We are not yet what we shall be, but we are growing toward it. The process is not yet finished, but it is going on. This is not the end, but it is the road. All does not yet gleam in glory, but all is purified. And I think what Luther is trying to get at is this as a final thought. While our ultimate destination for believers is eternity through faith in Jesus, we travel through a life of vocation, a life of calling in love and service to our neighbors. And in this life, there's a lot of roads that can take you. And even if you think you made a wrong turn, what does your GPS device do when you take a wrong turn? It says, recalculating. Trust that God is big enough that even in your mind, if you make a mistake, God can recalculate you, take you from where you're at, and get you moving back on the road of life again. That's what I got for tonight. Uh, any questions I can answer for you all? Well, thank you. Any questions I can answer? Thoughts, reactions? How about let's start with this. What was something helpful for you, especially as a young person in college, considering your future, that you took from this presentation? I think one of the things for me was discipline and tactic, because previously we married a culture of getting very involved with <laughs> 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 
Yeah. And so that was a really helpful sort of like part of the steps. Sorry. Yeah, I think as much as we want to be Superman or Superwoman and think we can leap over tall buildings in a single bound, we are finite beings. We have limited time, we have limited resources and talents, and you only can do so much. And so I think that's the tough thing is sometimes, boy, and it's like there's good options. Both could be good options or multiple good options, but at some point you ultimately have to say no to some things in order to say yes to other things. Here's an analogy for you. I've got some rose bushes outside of my house and every spring I have to prune them. Now the purpose of pruning is, first of all, you cut away the dead that's taking up space. You cut away the sick that's robbing of life. The tough part is sometimes to get the great, you gotta cut away some good. That's where, that, that's the tough decision. I saw another hand over here. Yeah, please. Just kind of like picture, I, I like to think of art. So I just noticed the cross and I really appreciate yep. that like pouring in and from there it goes yeah. out. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. Mm -hmm. Whoever would follow me should take up their cross, deny themselves, take up your cross and follow me. So that vertical and horizontal meets right there in the cross of Calvary. Yeah. Good. Anything else that was a takeaway for you or maybe an aha moment? Yeah, please. Well, just as a liberal arts major and someone who has sat through a couple of talks about next step to post college and just kind of seeing the presentation of, oh, it's okay, you can do this other thing that you're supposed to do, you can go and get a job that you should make money with, you can go and do these things, you're supposed to do this after you go. It just was reassuring for someone who's more interested in the liberal arts and everything to, I don't know, see a purpose in going your own track instead of the, you should do this, you yeah. should do that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there's, there's freedom in it. And, and to say that whatever track you pursue, I mean, so what are you hoping to do with your career? That's a wonderful question. Okay. <laughs> I ask good questions as coaches. Um, that is a wonderful question that sitting through some of those other lectures have hopefully been helping me with. But so far, I, I see myself looking at more history, more research, more, right. um, I don't know, I, I fall into the own self-regulation of not productive to society, not keeping something afloat, but just kind of producing and researching something that hopefully is important to other people, but yeah. just doesn't hold that societal esteem, I yeah. guess. That's but again, I think the beautiful thing is through the eyes of faith, we see that, you know, it's not just what you do, it's what God does for you. And uh, just while, just because others may not see value doesn't mean that there's somebody out there or a community out there that isn't going to value the work that you do that is a blessing to them in the pursuit of knowledge or whatever it is you choose to do. Yeah, please. I saw you. Did you have your hand? No, maybe you didn't have your hand. Oh, that's okay. I saw your hand. Yeah, so I really appreciated. <clears throat> don't know whether it was Luther or a quote, quote, quote from you that mentioned that it's well. I guess it's the masks of God from Luther um, through uh, the hand of the farmer. God shows incredible generosity to His creatures. Um, so I wonder how we enter into that um, frame of mind as we're doing things that may not may not be so exciting or interesting, um, yep. may not be so passionate about. So I think it's a family one, you know. Uh, <laughs> so my wife is just tired of changing diapers. Yep. She's really I know. tired. Um, and it doesn't feel like God is providing, so how, that God is providing generously to our children through that. We know that he is, but how yes. do we enter into it? Um, and so any, any thoughts? Yeah, that? well, first of all, there's a great quote from Luther on that. And, and actually, Luther was pretty equal opportunity for his time. So he talks about a father changing his child's diapers. Mm -hmm. And while his friends may mock and laugh at him, that that altar or that changing table is an altar unto God. Because what would happen to a child if we didn't change diapers? They would drown and die in their own mess. I mean, it's like, you know, let's face it, praise God for your moms and dads who changed you for all those years. Um, and, you know, perhaps if the Lord blesses, someday you'll have that opportunity. But it's, 
it's 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 helping to see things. Yes, it's daily grind and it's tough. Sometimes our callings and vocations are not all exciting. It's the small things in life. It's the mundane. But it's through the eyes of faith that we see that there's a greater significance to it. So one, Luther would say, remember your baptism. Because in remembering your baptism daily, you remember your calling. You remember, I'm a child of God, I'm a priesthood of all believers, and I'm called to love and serve my neighbor. Now, the question is, is who is my neighbor that God has put in these different areas? In that case, your neighbor is your child. Which, by the way, changes fa family dynamics in a lot of cool ways. Because now it's not just my kid with a dirty diaper or the kid who you know, uh, needs help with the homework or I've got to rush my kids off to soccer practice or whatever it might be. This is my opportunity to love and serve my neighbor in the face of my child or your spouse or whatever it might be. Um, I even love the whole, how it changes how we look at economics. So I just had a podcast, uh, which I should go live in the next day or two with um, uh, my boss's son. Uh, so uh, Reverend Dr. Bill Harmon, who used to be pastor at King of Glory here in town, he's now president of the, the uh, Southeastern District. And his son, Noah, uh, we did an interesting podcast on his decision not to go to college. And he decided to go into the trades as a plumber. Now, uh, my wife could tell you, while I may have done a lot of work in theology and coaching and doing a doctorate, the last thing in the world you want me to do is to do plumbing in the house. I flooded a house one time. Uh, not good. So in God's economy of love and service to neighbors, um, a plumber like Noah, he loves and serves me by doing something I'm not as gifted at in God's workmanship, gifting, and design in my life. He comes and fixes my sinks and my pipes and toilets and issues. And then I love and serve him by giving him a salary, paying him for his service, of which then he can provide for himself and perhaps one day a family, uh, if God calls him to that. And so it changes the economics of how we see the world and um, services that we offer ourselves. And by the way, you know, for me, I, I saw the other day, we were changing our tires and I, I would have walked over to Starbucks, but the, the across the street was kind of busy. So I went to McDonald's. And so I'm, I'm having a coffee at McDonald's and I, there's a big move right now to do away with in-person service. So Texas just um, launched their first McDonald's that it's kiosk, no people, delivery of the food, no people. It's all robotic and automated. Uh, we're seeing a lot of jobs disappearing. But I saw the value of what somebody behind a, a cash register can do. In that a gentleman, they were talking, he's like, yeah, it's my birthday today. Happy birthday. And the, the, the salesperson was so excited and said, you know what? Your breakfast is on me today. And it just the glow on his face. Oh, thank you so much. You don't have to do that. No, no, no. Happy birthday. This is my gift to you. In that moment, she wasn't just giving him a, a McGriddle you know, and a coffee, she was blessing him by giving a gift and acknowledging this special day in his life. That's Luther's teaching on vocation. And so it takes the everyday and the mundane and it makes it something exciting. Yeah, please. A lot of the vocations that you've talked about, or at least the examples that we've used in this talk, have um, so far been morally un unambiguous. They have a clear service to others. Um, there's nothing wrong with milking a cow. There's no potential harm to others in taking care of a baby. Um, but nowadays, because of the interconnected nature of things, yep. um, a job that may seem good, um, may be serving people in one way, may harm others. Um, a cattle rancher is, uh, is, is providing food for the world, but also um, possibly damaging the environment. Someone who works at a law firm may be in their capacity at that law firm doing good, but that law firm may be harming people, cheating people in other ways. Someone who's in banking may, as a bank teller uh, or as a banker, um, be, uh, be serving people well, but the bank itself, the system itself that they're contributing to, right. um, may be harming others. How, what advice would you give um, to people uh, in choosing uh, how much harm is too much harm, um, what what vocations to go into if those vocations have been, are there are there some vocations that are just off limits, um, and and how do we think of 
as a community of people, how do we think community in the sense of a community? Yep. When no, it's a great question. It's a great question because um, there's there's a lot of moral issues that, that come into play. Um, let me start here, and then I'm going to try to work back way backwards to your question. Imagine somebody with a knife plunging it into another human being. Is that something God calls you to do or not? Well, oh. <laughs> Ultimately depends, right? If you're Jack the Ripper, no. If you're a doctor and that knife is a scalpel and you're bringing health and healing, yes. So sometimes it's a matter of, okay, is this within God's will, that river or not? Now, there are some that, in, you know, it's flowing pretty quick. There's others that you're, you're kind of up on a rock or kind of on the edge, but it doesn't mean you're still not in the river. Um, ultimately, I think it comes down to this is, and, and Luther would probably advise this, not going against your conscience or God's word. So if it's not overtly prohibited in God's word, it's not doing harm to a neighbor, and, and in your conscience, you're okay with it, um, I think let that be your guide. And if for you as in your conscience, it's like, listen, just from my conscience standpoint, I can't do that, listen to that. If it's something you're okay with, let that be your guide in that. You know, pray. Sometimes you make a mistake. The, the wonderful thing, again, is God's grace recalculating. You can always repent. Uh, Luther even says there's what he calls the cross of our vocations. There is a moment in which maybe there's a moral quandary. There comes moments in which we get tired, we make mistakes, we blow it. Um, Satan is always trying to get us to sin in our callings and vocations as well and, and shipwreck us that he says that there, there comes this, this cross of our vocations where we've got nowhere else to go but to the cross of Jesus. And there God meets us not with condemnation, but with grace, forgiveness, a new beginning that we then can stand up and, and, and carry on. And it may be carrying on in the same vocation, just with renewed energy. It may be God calls us to something different.